Thank you, Janice. Uh, the good thing about wearing a suit is you can go around campus and nobody knows who you are, like, because <laughs> they never see me like this. So uh, it's been a nice way to sort of sneak around. Um, but I'd like to, again, thank the President and Janice for uh, the opportunity and for this award. I especially want to thank uh, Dean Strong, who's here, and Allison Allen, who is our departmental chair, who put the nomination package together. So thank you for doing that. Uh, I know these things take a fair bit of work, and I appreciate you taking the time to do it. Um, so when I was thinking about what I would do today, I was sort of asking around people and saying, what, what do you want to hear? And most people said they'd like to hear your story. So I'm going to kind of tell you my story. And my story is made up mostly of people who influenced my life. And, uh, and it's going to kind of take you through um, where I was and where we got to at this point. Eventually, we're going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit about gap junctions. And this is something that was taken from an article that we wrote um, with a couple of colleagues uh, showing two what's supposed to be cells. So we have lots of cells in our body. And these cells are now touching each other. And if you look very carefully, you can see that there's this connection going through here. And this is what we would call a gap junction. So the artist who drew this thought this is the good way to look at gap junctions. And we thought, OK, it's not the way I would draw it. It kind of looks like Game of Thrones or something. But uh, anyway, it, it's what they liked. So the beginning starts at the beginning. Um, <laughs> So my mother tells me this is me, but I don't think so. Um, <laughs> like, I looked at this picture a lot, and I'm thinking, I don't see anything in there that looks like me. But uh, apparently, I think it might be my sister. But anyway, <laughs> it's, it's supposed to be me. Uh, it all started in 1960. And since we're in an academic environment, I thought I'd show you the, a very high-profile school that I actually went to when I was young, and that's this one. Uh, you've probably never heard of it. It's a little country school in Prince Edward Island. Um, this happens to be my bike right here. Uh, this is the pump for water. Uh, the schoolhouse is here. This is the outhouse, by the way. So needless to say, the smells were kind of interesting as you went through school. Um, and education was done differently. So this is what education looked like for me for my first six years. And this is uh, me working right here at my desk. This is my brother not working. Um, <laughs> Now he became a successful farmer and now is retired, and I'm still working. <laughs> so who won that game? <laughs> and this is Mrs. Manimal. And she had 28 students, uh, grades 1 to 8, and she taught them all, all subjects. So uh, in those days, you learned math a little bit, reading, writing, very basic stuff. And so it was an interesting start. But if you think about the challenges of education that we have now, when we're always talking about this, uh, I can't imagine this uh, lady getting up in the morning saying, how am I going to deal with my day? Because she had to deal with a lot of different uh, avenues and venues through the day. Um, I then subsequently moved on and went to the University of Prince Edward Island. Now, most of you are aware of the McLean's rankings. Well, I was fortunate to be at UPEI when the first rankings came out. And it was ranked the second worst school in the country in their category. So I thought, wow, this wasn't a good decision. <laughs> but it, it actually turned out it was a good decision. Um, but I was particularly influenced by this person, this first person I'm going to mention. And this is uh, Dr. Jim, uh, James Rigney. And James Rigney had a very pronounced stutter. And as a child and growing up, and I still to some, uh, some degree today, I have trouble with language. He had a very pronounced stutter. And I remember what he said to me, or all of us, when we came in. He said, in 30 seconds, you'll know what my weakness is. And he said, by the end of the term, I'll know yours. And so, and so it was his way of saying, we all have weaknesses. We all have things we have to overcome and, and deal with. Um, so we know we all are going to go through that. Um, then I bought a car. And in those days, uh, it was very important to have a car as a young man in Prince Edward Island because you couldn't get around very well without it. And I saw a poster which showed this. And it was a picture of University of British Columbia. And literally, I looked at that poster on the wall at UPI. I thought, wow, that'd be a nice place to go. And, uh, and then in those days, for those who are old enough, you rip off the tab at the bottom, and then you put it in the mail, and you see if anybody's interested in, in uh, uh, taking you on as a student. So they, they were interested. And particularly, this, uh, this man here, Dr. Robert Moldy, Bob Moldy, uh, became my PhD and master's uh, supervisor. And Bob was really very influential in my life. Bob was very, very, and is very, very uh, particular. So you have to get it right. 
Like a nine is not an eight and an eight is not a seven. So if you're gonna give a number, you give the exact number. So he taught me a lot about doing exact science. Don't give me that kind of roundabout. What is it and what exactly is it? And Bob became a very successful uh, scientist uh, over the years and has won many awards. Um, and in those days I worked on vision research. So I worked on rhodopsin and photoreceptor cells. And it was a really good time. Um, it was a time in life where um, I, I think I learned to ski, I learned, I did a lot of running and all kinds of things during those periods of time. But moving on, um, I next went to the home of the Big Bang Theory called Caltech, and I think maybe it's known more for the Big Bang Theory than it is for Caltech nowadays. Um, and I was fortunate to work with this man, and this is John Paul Ravel. Now John Paul Ravel was the person who actually coined the name Gap Junction, and I'll get to that in a second. So he was a founder of the field. Um, he's, he's still alive and living in California. And he taught me about how to think big and try, don't get caught up in some details as I was taught to do, but also remember that, but also think about what's your vision? What are you gonna do going down the road? What do you think the next thing is? And so he was really inspirational uh, during those period of time. And I also had some other things to do, so I played hockey. Uh, of all things, I played hockey at Caltech. Now, when you're at Caltech and you're, and you're living in California, getting on the hockey team is really easy. All you gotta say is you're Canadian, and they say, we'll take you. And, and so I actually went out and watched some practice and I thought, well, you know, I think I can play with this team. So uh, it was a lot of fun. We played four years, we won the state championship twice, um, and uh, I think this was one of, those, the, one of those times. But it was all club sports, so it was pretty low key. Any midget team here in Canada would beat us badly. Um, so science, um, it's, during that time is when I started to work on gap junctions. Now gap junctions is a really kind of an odd name because when you say gap junctions, People think of a clothing line or something, and uh, it's not really that. Here's one cell, so this is an electron micrograph, so this is a very high magnification image. You can see one cell over here, another cell over here, and you see this structure going through here. And if you magnify it, you see there's a little bit of a gap between the two uh, membranes. So these are membranes that are pushed together, these two cells are coming very close together, and it got the name gap junction because there was a little bit of a gap between them. Now if you take that and you do what's called a negative stain and you can turn it on sort of looking at it from a bird's eye point of view, you can see that you have all of these little spots, little dimples and, and with something around it. Well those are channels and at the time we thought they were channels and people in the early days when they did the electron microscopy, they thought it was channels and then you can crack them open and you can see these particles which are really these channels. And so this became the beginning of the gap junction world, which is about 60 years old now. So when I arrived at Caltech, there was only two proteins known to make up these channels. And at that point, there was sort of a lot to do. People were starting to do the biochemistry and the molecular biology on them. And so now, there are 21. So it's fortunately, it almost makes two soccer teams. So this is my dream team for the World Cup. And we got Brazil playing Canada. And Canada gets all 11 players and Brazil gets no keeper because the only way we're going to score is we got to make sure they don't have a keeper because we're probably not going to get too many shots in that. But these are all the different molecules and proteins that make up a gap junctional channel and they're called connexins. And they're different sizes because they're, they're basically different molecular weights so that's why they have these different names. The most common one, and I put them here in the keeper, is connexin 43, because um, half of all the cells that you have in your body will have that connexin expressed, and it becomes sort of the big player if you want to think of it that way. Um, so moving on, we decided that I'd show a little bit of an animation that Eric made for me, and this is uh, molecules moving through a gap junction. You can see there's lots of molecules that can go through a gap junction. Now what's the criteria? Well the criteria is that it has to be small. So there's actually 3,300 members of the metabolome or small molecules that can actually go through a gap junction. And we don't really know how that all works, but we know that if we change the gap junction, a different set of gap uh, molecules may go from one cell to another. So now you're exchanging cell uh, molecules back and forth. The thing to keep in mind, we have 37.2 trillion cells. And all of our cells will do this, almost, almost all. There's a few exceptions. 
So the question is, if you were to guess, how many of these 3,300 molecules do we actually know anything about in terms of how they go through or what they do when they go through a gap junction? Uh, the answer is 18. So when people say, do we understand how gap junctions work? I would like to say, not really. We got a long way to go because we only really know this group of small molecules. Many of these we would call secondary messengers uh, that go through gap junctions. So there's a lot to learn here. The other thing that's interesting about gap junctions is that when you start to study them, you realize that most cells will express two members of those uh, connections. So in other words, two soccer players are being expressed in the same cell. So if you have one and then another, now you can get these type of a mixed oligomers of different nature. We call these heteromeric uh, type of arrangements. They can make this channel what we call a hemi-channel that sits at the cell surface, and so they can start exchanging these small molecules from inside the cell to outside the cell. So there's a subset of our field that actually looks at this in quite detail. Then you get these coming together to make a full gap junction, and this is where you get these molecules going back and forth. And here's a list of some of those molecules there. So think about it, at most cells in your body will have two of those. If you have two, you have 196 different channels that can form, but just by basically how you intermix these channels. And so it's a big, big question, there's lots, we call it our black box, because we don't really know what are the important small molecules that go through these channels, and why is it important in your skin, different in, in your liver, different in your kidney, and so every organ will be doing this. And then, to the, the make matters a little bit more difficult, we found another family of proteins called panaxins, and these panaxins make channels like this as well. So they allow this part, they do not allow this part. They only allow small molecules to go from inside the cell to outside the cell, and they turn to signal to other cells. So those small molecules that go through, they get out there, then they can signal what we call paracrine or endocrine uh, signaling to the neighboring cells. And we know that these are important in a bunch of different um, diseases like melanoma, osteoarthritis. They even get hijacked for HIV infection, so the virus actually can use these channels to get inside the cells. Uh, they're important in uh, ischemic stroke and a bunch of other diseases as well. So I'm not going to talk any more about these because we just don't have too much time. So moving forward, um, when I was at Caltech, we did this experiment. So in the days, uh, we didn't have a lot of the reagents. So one of the reagents that's very good to use to study proteins is to get antibodies. And, and in that time, we were making antibodies in these rabbits. These are New Zealand white rabbits. You can make antibodies in them. And we wanted to look at the heart. And we wanted to understand how long do gap junctions live in your heart? They're absolutely required for rhythmic beating of your heart. If you don't have them, your heart's going to get into arrhythmia and you're going to have disease. So we wanted to know how long do they actually live in that configuration. So I won't go through this experiment, but we, this is a pulse chase experiment where you can label it with a radioactive isotope, chase it out over time, and you can determine what is the half-life. And the take-home message here is that in basically in 24 hours, the gap junctions in your heart will actually completely turn over. So that's a very energy demanding thing. So why would you want to have to turn them over so fast? So do they wear out? Do they get old? We don't really know. But we do know that that has to happen in a normal, healthy human being. And so they turn over very, very quickly. So at this point, um, moving on past Caltech, we had uh, Alyssa was born, and that's, uh, she was actually born in Hollywood. So when you go, you know, you do those games where you go around the table and say, tell me something interesting about yourself, she often says she's born in Hollywood because I uh, think that's kind of cool. We go on the Walk of Fame, and this is Mickey Mouse star, and it's interesting cartoon characters can even get stars. And I put him here because eventually mice are going to enter our world uh, shortly. So on to, Cal, uh, on to McGill, this is where I had my first faculty um, position um, starting in 1992. And we got interested in continuing to work on these gap junction proteins. So this be, kind of became the beginning of my independent career. And we started looking at jellyfish uh, proteins called green fluorescent proteins. So these proteins are found in these jellyfish. And at the time, you could find ways to actually tag your molecule of interest. In this case, this is a connexin put green fluorescent protein on it, and then subsequently express it in cells. And you can then study them in live cells. So here's two cells. And if you were watching that movie, you would have seen pieces of this gap junction being taken off from the interface of where two cells are coming together. 
So this is like you're taking a bite out of your neighbor. So this cell here decided, I'm gonna take a piece of gap junction, bring it in and degrade it. And this is part of this rapid turning over that I was mentioning. And you can look at it in big populations. So this allowed us to look at living cells. And it was a very um, sort of cutting edge at the time. We weren't the first to use GFP, but we were one of the first labs to use GFP on these integral membrane type proteins. And we were the first to be doing it on connexins. So it became a very uh, important part of our studies for a while. Uh, moving on to Western, and Western starts in 1997. Um, and again, people, uh, a big influencer in my life at that time was Jerry Kidder. Jerry Kidder was here. Um, he was really actively engaged in mouse studies, um, and we started getting into transgenic mice and mutant mice, and Kevin, who's here, was Jerry's technician. Uh, Kevin eventually came and started working with me after Jerry retired. Jerry actually has one of these distinguished university professorships as well. And the other person that was here is Chris Noss, who's also here. And Chris um, was working on uh, cancer, and particularly he worked as a neuroscientist. He worked on brain tumors, but we got interested in uh, Chris's work because both of these guys actually worked on gap junctions. So this was a really good uh, emphasis for me to move here and to start become part of this team. We created the gap junction group, eventually recruited Dung Ling Bai, who's here as well. Um, so moving on from that, we uh, still tried to balance life, and so I was coaching soccer for a number of years. Uh, this is Alyssa now. She's not the baby that you saw earlier. This is Alyssa here. Uh, coached soccer in uh, uh, competitive league for a number of years. A lot of fun. It was really nice to integrate your science with your life as you go along, and I think it's very important for young faculty to consider to make sure you have a good balance because uh, life is important and you want to get the most out of it. So moving into gap junctions further, we decided now, okay, we, we understand that gap junctions are important in this life cycle. So we did a lot of work looking at how they were synthesized. And this is an endoplasmic reticulum. And this is a, a graphic, again, from the Scientific American magazine. Uh, they traffic to the Golgi apparatus. Here they make these hemi channels. But really what they want to do is they want to dock with each other and make these gap junctions. And then they can send these, again, 3,000 molecules or more between each other. Sometimes they take a bite out of each other. We, we, term, uh, we coined this term called a connexosome um, because that means it's mostly an internalized structure that comes into the cell and then eventually gets degraded. Um, with uh, Chris's uh, influence and, and with uh, other people that were working on cancer projects related to connexins, we got really interested in um, breast tumors in particular. And so we spent a lot of time over the years looking at connexins as tumor suppressors. And so in this particular um, story, uh, just as a summary slide that we took from one of our Nature Reviews cancer articles, so we wrote two of them. We wrote one in 2010 and one in 2016. And you can see here what the story really is about is how connexins get reduced in that's forming in situ in the duct of a, a breast cancer patient. Uh, eventually to go through intravasation, they still have reduced connexin levels, get into the bloodstream, migrate over into the bone in this case, and now in the bone they can subsequently uh, metastasize and start growing a tumor. And then there is some evidence that in this later stage actually connexins start coming up again. So in this particular point they're tumor suppressing, but later on it looks like they may actually be tumor promoting. So this makes them very difficult to consider as a therapeutic target because if a patient already has a metastasis, you don't necessarily want to give them something that's going to elevate their connexins, particularly because it may give the tumor an advantage. So we started considering this. There's a lot of work on this stuff um, over the years. There's about 1,600 papers on gap junctions and cancer. Uh, we did a summary of that in the year 2016 because it was the 50 year anniversary from the first report of when uh, connexins were shown to be tumor suppressors in tumor cells. So we kept going on, and this is an example of just uh, some of this kind of work. Um, here we have a connexin minus tumor, and when we put connexins into them, you can see here that it takes on a different structure. So what it's doing, it's trying to revert itself to more of a normal breast tissue. And by doing that, it sort of reverts the phenotype. So this looks like there was some promise that maybe if you took early tumors and you got connexins elevated in them, you could actually get something that would take on a more normal uh, tissue phenotype. And that was some of the work that we published over the years. And it still has some promise, but again, because it has this di uh, diphasic um, situation where 
our biphasic situation where it may be a suppressor early on but a promoter later on, uh, it gives us some pauses to whether or not therapeutics would actually be useful in this particular area. What has become a big story, and we've got into this uh, about 15 years ago, is uh, approximately 20 years ago, the first diseases were identified where mutations in the genes and encode connections were found to be linked to diseases. And the most prevalent one, and Brian Ullman's here and, and is, uh, works in this area, and we've started collaborating with Brian, is uh, sensory neural hearing loss. So it turns out that about 50% of all children that are born with hearing loss, sensory neural hearing loss, have mutations in the connexin genes. And so that's really quite a very prevalent number. And in fact, if you have children or grandchildren and you think they have hearing loss, they'll go down to the south end of the city and they'll be genotyped to see if they carry mutations in two of these genes. It's that prevalent. So it's really become a big area. And through collaboration with Brian, we could start getting into this study um, because now we had somebody who had the expertise in doing uh, hearing studies. And we've now published uh, uh, two or three papers on this and it continues to be a very fruitful area to study. Uh, the other area we have looked at pretty extensively is skin diseases. It turns out that about 11 skin diseases that you can inherit um, have mutations in the connexin genes, and that's why you have the skin disease. Some of these diseases are absolutely uh, devastating. These children will die within a few years. Others can be con uh, been treated and you have a morbidity, but you can uh, deal with it to some degree through your lifetime. So they, they really have a very big spectrum how, how severe they can be. Um, the one that we've looked at a lot is this one, it's a developmental disease called ocular dental digital dysplasia. So you want to say that five times really fast, it's kind of tricky. Um, but these are, this is the connection that I showed you back that was in the net. This is the connection 43. So it's very central to early development. And as you go through development, this connection is expressed in multiple organs and tissues during development. But when it manifests as disease, it's very selective in where you get disease. You get it in some tissues, but not others. In one tissue, you don't get disease is your heart. Now, remember what I told you about the heart needing to turn over at gap junctions every 24 hours. Well, the big connection in your heart is 43. But these patients don't have heart disease. So it's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating why that is. And that's something that we're digging into and trying to sort out. Uh, lastly, I'll mention where we're moving to, and we're starting to model human diseases uh, in different ways. So we, because we can get access to patients, you can actually get uh, biopsies from patients, uh, take these bio biopsies and reprogram them into inducible pluripotent stem cells, and that's what's shown here. And this is a very uh, routine thing to do nowadays. It was discovered years ago, won the Nobel Prize. Um, so this is now a strategy used by many investigators. Once you have these inducible stem cells, you can actually differentiate them into a number of different tissue types. And uh, Jessica in my lab has done a lot of this already. And she's going to go off and, and take some of this to her own laboratory. And being able to build them into a number or let them differentiate into a number of different tissue types. Now, what you can do with that, because they're diseased at the beginning, you can actually use them as a drug discovery platform. Or you can go in this direction and say, well, maybe we can edit the, the mutation, fix it, using CRISPR, and CRISPR is becoming very big now, and so couldn't you use CRISPR to actually repair the gene mutation and basically rescue to a normal phenotype? So we're starting to get into those ideas using iPSCs as a platform together with a CRISPR-Cas9 as a strategy to actually go back and try to fix mutations. So that's getting very, very interesting and very fun. So uh, lastly, I'll finish off with a couple of things. Um, teaching and services is an award for the sort of the full gamut of, of what we do at the university. And I, I really enjoy all the elements. I, I think diversity and what we do every day is actually part of the enjoyment. Um, I lectured to the medical and dental students. I created a couple of discovery-based cell biology courses. And in one of these courses, we started to deal with medical uh, ethics, which is interesting because a lot of the students, when they get to fourth year, they've never taken any ethics. So it's really kind of uh, interesting and important that they get some ethics before they actually graduate um, from their undergrad degrees. I'm really a big uh, um, proponent of community outreach. I think part of it as scientists, we need to try and find ways to deliver our science to the community. And so I've tried to do this with different, uh, different venues, including the Canadian Cancer Society I've given many talks to. And I think engagement at all levels. Like I think as a, as, uh, I think we really have a really 
um, great job. I think in many ways it's one of the best jobs in the world I can imagine. We have a lot of autonomy. You can do what you want to some degree. Um, and, uh, and you work when you want. You hire who you want. You bring your people into your lab, uh, that you, people that you choose. So it's, it's really a privileged place to, to actually work. And so I think we have a responsibility to engage at all levels as a faculty member. And as an example, one of the things I did with Jerry uh, Jerry Kidder, Chris Noss, uh, and Paul Lampy as we create we had the first ever Canadian Gap Junction meeting, which was in 2005, and this is where we brought in about 250 people from around the world who studied connections, and it was a great time, as well as a really good opportunity to sort of sell Canada. So lastly, the drivers in uh, my life has really been the team of people that's around me. And you're gonna see some pictures flash up. These are pictures that of the various lab um, groups from Christmas parties and summer parties and so on. And these are the people that really make it happen. And I can't go through them all by name. Uh, you may notice there's a guy in there named Kevin Barr. He never ages, so he, every time you see him, he looks the same. Um, so he, he's got that youthful gene, right? Um, but it, it's like uh, people ask me what I do, and I, and I guess what I do is sort of manage a lab because I don't, you know, in the end of the day, it's the people around you that actually make things happen. And the second group of people I'll, I'll bring up is actually the collaborators. Um, and again, you'll see these are people that we've published with over the last 15 years or so. And, and again, it's going to get very populated. And these are um, PIs from different laboratories around the world. Many of them are local. Some are not um, here. And there's three people in here, and you've got to pick them out, that I have coffee with, but I haven't published with. And so they're in there as well. So uh, again, I think it, it, work, work should be enjoyable and it's important to have a balance in your life uh, through all of these things. Um, most importantly, I'm going to do the next one, which is really family. And this is my lovely wife, Catherine, um, and our children. And, and I think over the years, and my late wife, uh, Cheryl, is here as well. Um, and it was uh, just an, a sort of a conglomerate. We even got the puppy in here. This is the new puppy. <laughs> Um, so it's important, again, to just have that balance. And, and lastly, uh, faith has been a very important thing to me, and uh, this is a couple of things that are in my office. And I think we have to renew ourselves uh, in what we do, we, and I think with that, you, can, uh, you, you, you s rebuild yourself when things are hard, when you don't get your grant, or your paper gets rejected, or whatever. Um, the reason why this is there is because this is a story uh, from Chariots of Fire. So if you know the story of Chariots of Fire and Eric Little and Harold Abrams, it's one of those stories I think is quite inspirational as movies that won Best Picture in 1981. And with that, I'll close and thank you for your attention. Thank you.